Thanks to everyone who's joined us for this session today. We'll be talking about a topic that I'm very passionate about, which is composting. And today we're gonna to focus on advancing locally-based composting in our mid-Atlantic region. I'm excited to be joined by two colleagues of mine, Linda Bilsons Brolis at the Institute for Local Self-Reliance and Thomas Fazio at EcoCity Farms in Bladensburg, Maryland. I'm gonna give a brief overview before I pass the mic over to Linda and then to Thomas. And after all three of us have presented, we'll move into questions and answers. So if you have any questions during the session, please post them in the chat and we'll get to them at the end. I wanna start off on this slide with a few questions that I'd like you to think about today. So you see here images of yard trimmings, surplus and excess food and food scraps. These are some of the organic materials that we often throw away, whether it's at the curb, in a dumpster or in our trash cans. What if we viewed food and other organic materials as resources rather than as waste? And so instead of calling grass, clipping, crip, grass clippings and branches yard waste, what if we called them yard trimmings? And instead of calling food scraps food waste, what if we called them wasted food? By tweaking the terminology, we can flip the dialogue. I recently heard the following question, which is the second one on the slide and wanted to share it with you to think about as well today. If we are producing it, aren't we also responsible for managing it? Next slide. Most of us don't think of the impacts of the food that is wasted, be it on farms, from our plates, or during the supply chain. But food loss and waste represents 8% of global greenhouse gas emissions. And that's more than double the greenhouse gas emissions of the airline industry which is at two to 3%. You can see in the image here, some of the environmental impacts of just one year of food loss and waste in the United States. So the GHG emissions of more than 42 coal fired power plants, an area of agricultural land equal to California and New York, and enough water and energy to supply more than 50 million homes. And those are the impacts of food loss and waste before it even reaches a landfill. Next slide. So I wanna talk about landfills briefly and what materials we are sending to them. EPA's most recent facts and figures report shows that landfills in the US are made up of approximately 24% food, 7% yard trimmings, 8% wood, and 11% paper and paperboard. Even if most of that paper and paperboard slice of the pie was diverted to recycling, we could still be diverting at least 40% of our organic materials from our landfills to better uses. Next slide. With 50% of our municipal solid waste stream in the US currently being sent to landfills, as you can see in the brown part of the pie graph, and only 8.3% composted in the dark green, there's a lot more of the pie to take a bite from. Next slide. I mentioned the environmental impacts of wasted food before food reaches the landfill. And here I wanna talk about the impacts at the landfill. When food and other organics break down in landfills where there's little to no oxygen present, the decomposition process generates methane, a potent greenhouse gas that contributes to climate change. And it's a greenhouse gas that's many times more potent than carbon dioxide. Here you can see in this pie graph that our municipal solid waste landfills are the third largest source of methane emissions in the US. By diverting all these organic materials that I mentioned from landfills and composting them instead, we could reduce methane emissions from our landfills and reducing food waste is an action that each of us can take in our daily lives. Next slide. Composting has a lot of benefits. And I just mentioned reducing methane emissions from landfills, which is a really significant one. I wanted to touch upon some of the other benefits of compost use that perhaps don't get as much attention. And I recognize that this long list goes against the advice for an effective PowerPoint slide, but I wanted to share with you just how many additional benefits of compost there are. So some of these include reducing soil erosion, helping to regenerate and remediate poor soils, increasing our resilience to extreme weather events like droughts and floods, reducing the need for chemical fertilizers, and most importantly, 
building healthy soils and local food production, which reinforces a culture of sustainability and engaged environmental stewardship. Next slide. Yes, we have a lot of challenges ahead of us in advancing composting capacity. Even if we diverted all our food scraps and other organics from landfills, we currently don't have enough capacity in the Mid-Atlantic region to compost at all. But we also have opportunities to grow that capacity. As states and local governments and tribes develop climate change and sustainability plans and goals, waste characterization studies show us that food waste is an area we should address. And you just heard many of the environmental benefits of why we should do so. As you hear from my two co-presenters today, you'll learn about approaches to community composting and on-farm composting in our region that can be replicated both in our region and beyond. And as we build out our mid-Atlantic composting infrastructure, we need to create a diversified and decentralized approach. Home, community, on-farm, large-scale composting are all important pieces, but no one size or scale is gonna meet all our needs. Next slide. EPA Region 3 has funded various projects and efforts to advance composting capacity in our region. And I just want to go over a few of our past grantees, which include the City of Philadelphia, Department of Prisons, Prince George's County, Maryland, the Institute for Local Self-Reliance, and EcoCity Farms. And the last two are going to be speaking after me. We have a new funding opportunity um, in region, EPA Region 3 that just opened last week, and it will close July 14th. Um, $150,000 is being made available to improve local post-consumer materials management in the Mid-Atlantic. Please check it out and share it with those who may be interested in applying. And while I didn't list it on this slide, EPA posts our federal funding opportunities for food loss and waste on our Sustainable Management of Food website, which will be on the next slide. And we also list them in our monthly Sustainable Materials Management newsletter, which is called In the Loop. And anyone can sign up for that. For example, USDA has a current funding opportunity right now that's open till June 15th for its Compost and Food Waste Reduction Cooperative Agreement Program. And nine entities, including EcoCity Farms, just received one of those USDA grants in 2022. And nine entities just in the Mid-Atlantic region, I should, I should specify, which is more than any other region getting those grants in the United States. So with all that, and you can turn to the next slide, um, here's my contact information. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out. And there's the website for sustainable management of food at EPA, which has links to the newsletter, funding, and all sorts of other resources and tools you can look at. With that, I'm now going to turn it over to Linda. Um, so we're going to switch slide decks. And while I'm introducing, while Linda's getting her slides up on the screen, um, I want to introduce her. Linda Bilsons Brolis is the senior program manager um, of the Neighborhood Soil Rebuilder Composting Training Program at the Institute for Local Self Reliance. And I'm going to turn it over to her. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, Ilana, for that introduction. Hello, folks. I'm Linda Bilsons Brolis. And in my presentation today, I'll be guiding you through some examples of what a diverse and locally based composting infrastructure looks like, what that looks like in our region, and how it has grown over time. Alrighty, but first, um, a little bit about ILAS R. Um, since its founding in 1974, the Institute for Local Self Reliance has been working to support thriving, diverse, and equitable communities. We work to build local power and fight corporate concentration, and we have four active initiatives and the Building Local Power podcast. And here's a snapshot of what we're all working on right now. Our Composting for Community initiative is advancing composting to reduce waste, enhance local soils, create community development opportunities, and protect the climate. We catalyze distributed food waste composting options that include home, community, and on-farm scales. We do this in a few ways. Uh, we convene a national community composter coalition and host networking and knowledge sharing opportunities, such as our cultivating community composting forums. We also have a podcast that features stories from the folks doing this work around the country. We produce reports and infographics and create templates for compost sites to use. 
We host regular webinars on topics focused on advancing local composting, ranging from equipment, policies, permitting, business models. We have a series focused on on-farm composting and compost use. We also have a series specifically focused on how local government can advance community composting. And we have a composting for community map where you can search for community composters, as well as policies that are advancing composting at this scale. You can find all of these resources on our website by selecting the composting resources drop down menu on the right hand side of the screen. So if I zoom through that pretty quickly, you can find all this on our website at your own time. As mentioned by Ilana, uh, I manage our training program. We launched our neighborhood soil rebuilders composter training program in 2014 in partnership with Eco City Farms, who you'll be hearing uh, a lot more about in a bit. Uh, we designed the NSR program to establish best management practices for community ba community based projects, which are often run on volunteer power, but not always. Uh, we hosted a number of master composter trainings in DC, Baltimore, Atlanta and Philadelphia. And then the pandemic happened. So in part due to the limitations for in person gatherings during the pandemic, but also in order to make high quality composting training as widely available as possible, we created the community composting 101 online certificate course. It's a self-paced course and features seven video-based learning modules followed by knowledge checks. There's a final exam and a certificate is provided upon completion. The course covers topics ranging from composting science fundamentals to site design and engaging the community in your project. So check out, check that out on our website. But now uh, let's get into the meat of this presentation. What do we mean when we talk about local composting? Essentially, Local composting facilitates the return of nutrients from food scraps back into our soils, creating more circular self-reliant food systems. Community composting is a particular type of local composting that prioritizes keeping the process and product as local as possible and engages the community through participation and education in the process. Now, where do local and community composting fit in our food waste reduction strategy? Uh, this is something that most people will have seen before. It's EPA's food recovery hier hierarchy, which provides a visual representation of the order of prioritization recommended to reduce the wasting of food. Here's ILSR's adaptation of this hierarchy. Um, and as mentioned before, we're unique in promoting a distributed and decentralized food waste reduction and recycling infrastructure that includes home, community, and on-farm composting options. After source reduction and edible food rescue, uh, we go, we get to the distributed local composting portion of the hierarchy, starting with home composting. Then small scale decentralized composting, including community composting. Uh, and then we also advocate for farm and town scale composting, which can overlap with the community composting section too. Um, here are some of the key benefits of community composting that ILSR has been documenting. Uh, community composting is cheaper and quicker to bring online than large and industrial composting facilities. Because community composting initiatives originate from within a given community, they are more likely to be in line with community values. Uh, local composting in general makes it more likely for compost to end up in local soils, which support local food systems. And when composting is done in a way that engages the community, opportunities are created for teaching practical skills and strengthening social ties. Because community composting initiatives can be started with low cost, low tech systems, they can be started in communities that have historically been under resourced. Now I want to uh, look at an example of how a number of different community based initiatives can successfully and synergistically exist in one community's composting ecosystem. Uh, the DC Department of Parks and Recreation's Community Compost Cooperative Network is an excellent example of how volunteer power can be harnessed to create compost for community gardens from local food scraps. Launched in 2014, the network currently has 50 sites around the city where residents can join a community compost cooperative. Each site has one of these three bin composting systems and can handle around 100 active composters or about one ton of total material a month. The network currently has more than 5,000 people participating. That's impressive. Uh, the cooperatives are generally located at DPR's community gardens, but some sites are located at K through 12 schools. The one shown here on the left is at Howard University's community garden. 
And this cooperative uh, was started as a capstone project for our Neighborhood Solar Builders Master Composter Training Program back in 2014 by Jeffrey Neal. Jeffrey has since gone on to start his own comp on-site composting consultancy called Loop Closing. But the Howard Garden site in specific has served as an essential community composting demonstration project for the region. Over the years, he has hosted countless volunteers as well as representatives from local governments, including from DC, Baltimore, and Philadelphia. Philadelphia is now in the midst of launching its own community compost network, which is very much informed by the DC network, and we continue to support them with training as they get launched. Um, another local composting option for the district includes the DC Department of Public Works' food scrap drop-off program, which launched on Earth Day in 2017. Through the program, residents are able to drop off food scraps for free at designated farmers markets in all eight, all eight of the city's wards. Some of which of some of these uh, drop offs operate year round. Thousands of people drop off several tons of food scraps each weekend. Um, this material is collected and co composted locally at district composting sites, as well as the composting facility in Prince George's County, Maryland. Compost Cab, a food scrap collection service provider and composter that's been operating in the DC metro area since 2010, 2010 is a linchpin in the local community composting system. Uh, they run residential and commercial collection services and bring freshly collected food scraps to sites participating in the DC Department of Parks and Rec's compost cooperative network. At some of these sites, they actually help to manage the composting systems uh, and finished compost is also delivered to service members uh, doorsteps. In addition, the DC Department of Public Works is uh, contracts with Compost Cab to manage its farmers market drop off program where Compost Cab, uh, what material Compost Cab can't take to local community sites, they take to the PG County facility. Um, but now expanding our view slightly to the broader DMV area, another community composter that's playing an essential role in building out our composting infrastructure uh, is Compost Crew. They're another food scrap collection service. Um, serving communities throughout the DMV, but they're actively developing uh, what they call compost outposts, which you'll be hearing much more about from Thomas. Um, these are small and medium scale composting systems that are located on farms. Eco City Farms, who we introduced previously as our partner in creating the NSR composter training program and who you'll be hearing about more in a minute, is one of the local farms partnering with Compost Crew to host a compost outpost. Um, I just wanted to take a moment to emphasize the phenomenal role that EcoCity has played in training hundreds of composting and sustainable farming practitioners and advocates over many years. Many people who are contributing to the composting infrastructure in the district, Maryland and Virginia and beyond have trained with EcoCity's Benny Eras, and I considered myself very lucky to have had him as my mentor myself. Uh, though Thomas will give a lot more detail about the outpost at EcoCity, I just wanted to give a snapshot of how they are contributing to a diverse, locally-based composting infrastructure for the region. Each outpost, which is made up of two modified shipping containers, can process roughly one ton of food scraps per week. Currently, Compost Crew has five units processing in Maryland, but they have plans for a few more coming this summer. And under a new law that just passed this legislative session in Maryland, the amount of composting capacity that these outposts could handle is likely to double. Uh, what's so great about this model is that it takes a significant amount of the responsibility related to managing the composting process off the farmer's shoulders. So when I think about uh, local community based composting, uh, this is the big picture of what I'm aiming for in my head. Uh, in Austria, uh, the entire country has a decentralized network of over 400 composting facilities that serve the country's roughly 8 million residents. Um, this results in over 300 pounds of uh, organic material collected per person annually. So uh, two thirds of these uh, 400 facilities are based on farms. So it's very much possible to make, take a big chunk out of our organic waste um, by partnering with farms and, and local composters. Um, so at this point, I just want to touch on uh, how we can support community and local composters. Um, this is a 
uh, excerpt from our 2022 Community Composter census, census, which was released back in March. Um, and you'll see that among the top challenges facing community composters are access to land and a lack of funding, which can, composters can use to scale up. The ILSR received, let me skip that. Um, and so here are some suggestions for folks in the audience, um, for advocates and policymakers for supporting uh, composting, community composting specifically, um, where you are able to in your funding and your project development um, so consider a diversified composting infrastructure. We also really need uh, to support keeping our feedstocks clean, keeping what goes to composting facilities clean. Um, this involves uh, keeping out potential contaminants. Um, examples are PFAS from food packaging or plastic or compostable cutlery. Compostable meaning the product uses the claim, but has not been tested and verified by the Biodegradable Products Institute. Um, keeping our food, uh, our uh, feedstock streams clean requires source separation. And this is a major challenge for the industry right now. Okay, some more recommendations specifically for folks that might be pursuing some of the USDA and EPA grant opportunities. Partnering with community composters can help you meet environmental justice goals, which are essential. Um, to do this, consider the needs of environmental justice communities from the very beginning uh, when you're designing your policies or programs. Bring existing local and community-based composter composters to the table when you're making your plans um, and be ready to pay them for their valuable services. Don't just assume that they will do it for free. Um, and just to close, here are some recommendations for expanding on-farm composting. Again, you'll see highlighted the need for keeping our feedstocks clean, source separation, if we want to create high quality compost that goes back into supporting local food systems, go back, goes back into soil to feed, uh, to grow more food that feeds our communities, we need to keep this material clean. Um, also essential is technical training and assistance, demonstration projects, as you've probably seen throughout this presentation, uh, the value of those can't be overstated. People being able to see composting, experience composting and see how it works is absolutely essential. So at this point, I'm going to leave it there. And there's my contact information. And feel free to reach out if you have any questions. Thank you, Linda. I really, I really want to say that ILSR is in many ways the leader in a lot of these conversations about community composting and on-farm composting and uh, provides so many helpful tools and resources and infographics and networks and training, including their community composting 101. So Thank you, Linda, and, and to your colleagues and to Brenda for leading the way on this and helping so many of us um, advance this conversation and it all across the entire country. Uh, with that, I am going to introduce Thomas Fazio, who is the compost manager at EcoCity Farms in Bladensburg, Maryland. Uh, if you get a chance to go out and visit, I highly recommend. And Thomas is going to take us through uh, what EcoCity Farms does and the innovative practices that they're implementing there. Take it away. Thank you, Alana, and thank you, Linda, for both doing a, a great job of setting the table and describing the need and the importance of having a distributed network of composting facilities um, beyond large scale facilities and home composting. There is a niche, a, a growing niche of uh, decentralized on farm composting models. And today I want to give you some details about the compost outpost at Eco City Farms. <clears throat> so the compost outpost at Eco City Farms was made possible due to the EPA Region 3 Enhanced Composting Infrastructure for a Healthier Environment Grant, which was awarded in 2021. Uh, the grant was a collaboration between the Prince George's County Soil Conservation District, ILSR, who you just heard a lot about, uh, Compost Crew, and us uh, over at Eco City Farms. So this grant was awarded to us in 2021, and the site has been operational since uh, September of 2022. On-farm composting, which Linda did a really good job of explaining, um, is, is important for a lot of reasons, right? We have um, set goals for food 
waste reduction. And in order to do that, there needs to be a diverse network of places where the food scraps can go and turned into a valuable um, resource. Um, and one of the things that is really exciting about working in Maryland is when we began the on-farm composting model at EcoCity Farms, we were operating on the 5,000 square feet um, uh, exemption for obtaining a composting permit. Now that 5,000 square feet exemption has been bumped up to 10,000 square feet um, and because of a lot of the hard work um, from ILSR. And so we are very grateful for that, that exemption. What, what that means and what that allows is for farmers um, to really get started very quickly on composting on their site. Um, and it, we are sort of at a point now where this is no longer, um, you know, the science has been out there for a very long time. It's very clear that we need to be doing this. We need to be doing a lot more food waste composting. And so this exemption allows for that to happen in a distributed network. Um, and the really cool thing about on-farm composting is it combines meeting those food scrap diversion goals while also creating something that can enhance soil health, that be compost. Um, so a little bit about where we're located. Um, Eco City Farms is based out of Prince George's County, Maryland. Um, we have three farms that we manage. Um, the farm with the compost outpost that we'll be talking about today is in Bladensburg, Maryland, which I have highlighted on the map here with our red dot. Um, really trying to you know, highlight the fact that although we're not in the district, we're three miles outside of the district, we are part of the DMV, we're inside of the Beltway, so we are very much in an urban environment here. And the image on the right-hand side of the screen is showing you the boundaries of the farm, right? So it's a relatively small farm when we're talking about farming as a whole, but for urban farming, it's pretty large, 2.5 acres. Um, within those 2.5 acres that I've highlighted in gray, um, I've also highlighted the areas where composting is occurring. So in blue, is where our compost outpost is, and we'll be going into more details um, on the specifics of that. And just below that is our worm house, which has been around um, since the early days of Eco City Farms. Um, I wanted to also highlight the fact, and you can see in this image here, that we are very close to residential housing. And one of the um, scares a lot of people have when they are kind of jumping into composting is uh, they're worried about people complaining about you know, noise or pests, odors, noises. Um, we have been able to successfully do composting in this space with an, zero complaints from our neighbors. Um, and it, it, it just goes to show that if you do it the right way and you pay attention to the details along the entire process, that those smells, pests, noises, those things are not a concern. And so we have pr a proof of concept here that we are able to do this in an urban setting. Um, with residential housing really on all sides. Um, we do have a nice tree buffer on the north hand uh, side of the property, but above that tree buffer is actually more residential housing. So this is very much in an urban setting that we are doing this composting. Um, before going any further, I needed to give a shout out to Benny. Um, so Benny Erez, for those of you who don't know Benny Erez, um, has been at Eco City Farms since right up, uh, almost at the beginning of the organization. Uh, Benny is the compost mastermind at Eco City Farms. He is responsible for training almost every composter I've ever met in the area. Uh, Benny used to work at the University of Maryland where he led their composting division. Um, Benny had the idea of re or sort of reusing and modifying shipping containers and turning them into places to do composting for aerated static pile composting. Um, and so Benny and I, in this picture here are standing in front of the first pile that we made at the compost outpost at Eco City Farms um, in September of 2022. So the compost outpost at Eco City Farms is a production operation. So every week, uh, 250 um, residential households worth of food scraps are being dumped at the site and we're making a new pile every week. Um, with that being said, the compost outpost at Eco City Farms is also designed um, to be a, a demonstration site. Uh, Eco City Farms is a teaching and learning organization. So we grow food, we make compost, but more importantly, we want to teach people how to grow food and how to make compost. And so because of that, we wanted to have a infographic in our space, front and center, 
for folks to come and learn how to make composting the way that we're making composting. There's no secret. There's absolutely nothing that we're doing that we're trying to hide. We want people to come and see what we're doing and learn how to do it ourselves. And so I also wanted to give a shout out to the artist who created this beautiful infographic. Uh, and I have her information at the bottom of the screen there. And this came about from actually a, a conversation I was having with her um, before the site was built. Uh, and I was explaining how the process worked. She recorded my words and turned it into this beautiful uh, infographic. And, and I think it makes it accessible for people from all walks of life. So we have students coming through from anywhere from elementary age to high school age, even college students coming through. And we also have adults coming through as well. And so it, it sort of reads like a comic book where you can get an idea of what's going on from the images. And then there's more details um, as well about the, the different parts of the process here. And we also have this infographic on our website uh, as well, if you're interested in checking it out. All right, so getting now into the details on what happens at a weekly basis at the compost outpost. Um, so every week, food scraps are collected from 250 residential households um, by compost crew um, and brought to the compost outpost. So you can see the image on the left here, uh, is a driver for a compost crew named John, who comes usually around 10 o'clock, 10.30, every uh, Thursday. Um, and he's dumping those food scraps onto our mixing pad. Um, prior to those food scraps being dumped onto the mixing pad, um, we will put a layer of wood chips and a layer of leaves um, on the bottom for the, the food scraps to be dumped on top of. Um, before mixing the material together and creating compost, uh, we do a decontamination sort. So all of the compost that we're making at ECO is staying on ECO to grow food for ECO. And what that means is that we wanted to create the cleanest compost that we can make. Um, and so we spend you know, a couple hours every Thursday after those food scraps arrive, pooling out non-desirable items. Um, so Primarily, or the first thing we're looking for is if anyone accidentally threw trash in their bins, which happens when you're dealing with post-consumer food scraps. Um, trash is being taken out, it is putting into bins, and those bins will eventually end up at a landfill. Um, after doing that, or sort of alongside doing that, we're also taking out compostable plastics. That includes the compostable liners, it includes items that have been deemed compostable, um, and it includes also paper products. So these are all items that would do better at a larger scale facility. So um, these, this material is taken out of the pile and put actually back onto the compost crew truck where they will eventually dump it at Western Branch. Um, it's something that uh, we've done sort of experimented with um, and we've determined that we do not want compostable plastic in our pile. Paper as well, um, because it skews the carbon to nitrogen ratio our goal is really to just be taking in food scraps and mixing those food scraps to create compost. So that decontamination process, like I said, can take a few hours um, depending on sort of how many people are involved with it, uh, how big the load is. Um, and once that process has been decontaminated, it is then mixed. So um, we at the compost outpost at Eco City Farms, we use uh, compost crews skip gear and we are very very thankful for the um, being able to use that, which allows us to really process this material very quickly. So that oftentimes that decontamination phase takes long, longer than actually mixing and loading the pile itself. And that's all due to the fact uh, that we're using the machinery to do that. Um, so the material is mixed and very well watered, and, right? So that's a very important part of the process. Um, and we're using the same recipe every single week. So we have leaves that we've sourced from local municipalities, from Bladenburg, from Edmonston, um, Cottage City. Um, every fall, they're bringing us leaves, which we are very thankful for. Um, we source wood chips locally as well. So um, tree crews who cut down trees in the area um, are dumping wood chips. Um, so we have a good supply of leaves, a good supply of wood chips that we're mixing in with the food scraps every week. Um, the goal really is to turn that pile of leaves, food scraps, and wood chips into a homogenous mix. Um, that process can take up to an hour. Um, 
And it's a very thorough blend of the material. You wanna make sure you're blending it as much as you can while applying water pretty much the entire time to moisten that pile and get it up to about 60% moisture content. Now, once that occurs, um, that material is then loaded into the bay, which you can see behind um, in the image here. Um, once it is loaded into its uh, aerated static pile bay, it's actually going to sit there for four weeks and will not be moved again. Um, inside of that aerated static pile bay, it is receiving air um, and those piles will heat up pretty quickly. So we've honed in and we've sort of figured out the right recipe. And now our piles are heating up, in, getting to about 130 degrees in, in three or four days, which we're really excited about. So I mentioned the fact that these are aerated static pile bays. Um, and that modifications have been done to these containers. So a very important modification that was done to these containers was um, drilling holes underneath the container and the backside of the container on the side that was not cut out, um, which allows us to blow air into the piles. Um, and so this is not sort of new technology. Composters have been doing this for a very long time. It was uh, pioneered by O2 Compost. Um, this is not, you know, really super sophisticated equipment that we're dealing with here. These are four inch uh, PVC pipes that you can get from a, a hardware store. Uh, the blower is, is, is not sophisticated as well. It's something that you can get for about $100 um, online. And, you know, it, it's as simple as turning that blower on for 15 to 20 minutes and pushing air through the pile. Um, I've shown an image on the right here of the holes that we have at the bottom of these containers, which allow that air to pass underneath the container and then up through the pile. And what that allows, uh, what that does is it allows us to leave that material in there for an extended period of time without having to go in and remix the material. Now, the site that we're operating on has no grid electricity. What that means is that in order for us to actually provide power for these blowers to turn on, we had to install solar. Um, and so all of the electricity that we're using to power these blowers is actually coming directly from the sun. So we installed um, panels on top of the containers, which you were able to see in previous images. Um, those panels are connected um, into a inverter slash charge control. Um, and so this is kind of an overview of how that solar system is set up. Uh, happy to answer questions um, about how this works. Um, this was a, you know, there's some trial and error involved in here, um, but we've now gotten to the point where we can actually power multiple blowers at once uh, and even charge um, power tools for the farm and also a fan, which is nice because in the summer it gets really hot. Um, so we're excited about having a fan in our office to kind of cool down in the summer heat. After four weeks in the shipping container, uh, the compost is moved uh, outside into a mobile windrow for further decomposition. Um, when it moves into this uh, mobile windrow, um, it is actually also still receiving oxygen either passively or actively. We have the ability to put a blower attached to that pipe with, which runs underneath the pile to push air into the pile. Um, so this you can think of as the secondary phase of this composting process. Um, and what this allows us is to keep it contained in a system that we are able to manage that we're not having to kind of move around, but we have it actually in a fixed location to, to create our windrow. Um, a smaller portion of the material that we make is being fed to our worms, which I mentioned we have a, uh, an area on the farm that, that is, is a dedicated worm composting operation. Um, and any of you who have dealt with uh, worm composting before know that they really love the material that's already started in decomposition. Uh, so we are feeding about five to 10% every week of this material that we're making at the compost outpost to the worms, um, very thin layers at a time, applying moisture. Um, and then that, that, vermica, that vermicast, excuse me, uh, is actually being used in our seed starting production. Um, so at EcoCity Farms, all of the food that we grow, all the plants that we grow, we grow in-house at our nursery. We make our own soil blends. Uh, and we're able to do that because of the vermicast that is being uh, produced at the farm. Um, so another important part of this process, and part of you know, any composting process, uh, is taking data, monitoring data, 
throughout the lifespan of that compost pile. Um, and so an image you see here on the left uh, is, is Benny taking um, CO2 measurements of a pile that's been in there for a few weeks. Now, measuring CO2 is very important. When you measure CO2, you're actually measuring oxygen. A lower CO2 count means a higher oxygen uh, count, which is telling you that when you're pumping air into that pile, it's actually passing through and oxygenating that pile. Um, this is especially important when you're sort of determining your mix, determining your, your feedstock recipe. What you want to find out is the material that you're blending together, is it allow, is, does it have enough porosity and airspace for that pile to oxygenate, whether it's a passive oxygenation or forced oxygenation process. Um, and so that is very important when you're figuring out your recipe. But even after you figure out your recipe, it's very important throughout the lifespan of the pile to ensure that that pile is not going anaerobic. Um, so in addition to testing for CO2, we're constantly monitoring temperatures. I mentioned that our piles are heating up very quickly with the recipe that we've developed. Um, we are looking for basically two numbers when we're, we're monitoring temperatures. We wanna make sure that a pile is getting to 130 degrees and it's staying there for at least a week. Um, we also wanna make sure because we're applying this compost to grow vegetables, we wanna make sure that it's also getting to about 150 to kill off any seeds that were in those food scraps that we've received. Um, and so this is something that is, is basically daily measurements. When, when we're at the site, we're, we're monitoring temperatures. Um, Bulk density is another kind of collection point you can think of that is very important when you're making your recipe, right? So bulk density is going to tell you um, the, the, the porosity in the pile. Um, and what we figured out is that we had to tweak our recipe to, to make, to use more wood chips to allow more air to pass through the pile. Um, so data collection is very important uh, in any type of composting process, whether it's in your backyard, medium scale, or at a large scale site. So this is a really exciting slide and something that I think we're really proud of. Um, we have now gotten to the point where we are not buying any compost from offsite. So all of the compost that is required to grow the vegetables at EcoCity Farms, we are producing in-house. Um, this is an image I took a few weeks ago of compost that we are applying to our fields. So the the image shows the compost, it shows the field, but I think the reason I really like this image on the left-hand side is it really shows how close we are to our neighbors. I mean, they, they are looking and they are seeing what we are doing. Um, and we've shown that this is possible. This can be done in an urban environment. Um, it, it's an example, I think, of everything that we do well at EcoCity Farms, uh, composting, food production, and being, um, really community resource, being a part of the fabric of the community. Um, so we're very excited to, to get to the point now where we are producing enough compost for our, for our um, growing operation. So a few of the lessons learned, you know, any project you're going to learn um, from your mistakes throughout the process or just learn, you know, how to do it better next time. Um, one of the things that we learned uh, with this project was that sometimes you have to, um, construction can take a, a long time. So this, this site took a little longer than expected to get up and running. Um, there were some unforeseen equipment costs. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that we are a nonprofit organization. Uh, we don't have cash reserves to sort of dig into. Um, and so things sort of happen in phases. Um, we are, were happy to get the site up and running when we did. Um, but it did take a little bit longer than expected to, to, from the moment we award, were awarded the grant to the moment we actually were, were composting. Um, it has to do with, with, with a lot of different things, but, but primarily, you know, a small organization, limited resources, um, limited hands on deck, and doing a lot of different things kind of prolonged the, the construction. Um, some of the, the question marks involved in this um, in, are still the economics of the ongoing operations of the site. Um, so we are still refining the process, um, but we have, we have the infrastructure in place and we do believe that, that what we've created can be replicated and, and can really um, help with, with um, making a dent in, 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 foods, in food waste. 
Um, we are excited to uh, announce, and, and Alana already uh, you know announced that we uh, have another comp uh, we have money for another compost outpost that will be built at Eco City Farms' um, third location in Upper Marlboro, Maryland, and so that will be uh, also in collaboration with with Compost Crew and the Town of Edmondson, um, and so that is going to allow the Eco City Incubator Farm um, to also have access to compost as well with a new compost outpost. Um, and so we're really excited about that. We've began construction already um, and we should be launching sometime later this summer or early fall. Thank you very much. Um, like Alana said, you know, we are, we love showing people the site. We love talking about composting. Um, that is why we are here. And so I would love to have um, as many of you all out at the site, at the site, showing you all the process as possible. So please don't hesitate to reach out um, if you're interested in learning more about what we're doing. So thank you all for coming and hope to see you at the site. Thank you, Thomas. That was fantastic. Uh, I know for me and hopefully for others, it's it's really wonderful when you get to see the pictures, especially if you haven't been out there and you can walk through all the different steps. It makes it really come alive and you all do an amazing job and I, I highly recommend going out to see it. Um, I want to open up the chat for any questions. Obviously it's open already, but um, if folks have any questions that they want to post. Um, I know one thing I see in here is that um, Shannon McDonald from the Maryland Department of Environment wanted to clarify that the 2023 Maryland House Bill 0253 about on-farm composting permits, or on-farm on -farm composting facilities and the permit exemption requires um, MDE to establish regs among other requirements prior to a non-on-farm composting operation to increase from 5,000 to 10,000. Um, and Linda added uh, an overview of the bill if anyone wants to look at that. Um, a question for Thomas, uh, how much grant funding did you receive for your composting project? So the, uh, the compost outpost at Bladensburg Farm um, was around $50,000 for the, the composting project. Great. And Linda, did you wanna talk about the PFRP? Uh, sure, somebody just asked a question about uh, the specific temperatures and length of time. And I just added some uh, info from our best management practices guide, but which I can link to as well. But um, the question was specifically about weed seeds and um, weed seed, well, weed being anything that you don't want growing in your compost. So uh, generally aiming for something higher, uh, like in the 150 range. Thomas, is that what y'all aim for, for getting rid of seeds? Yeah, and I think the question for how long should it be maintained at 150 degrees? Um, yeah, I think that the key thing here, and something I didn't mention in my presentation was, you want to make sure it doesn't exceed 165 degrees, right? And so sometimes that's, that's difficult to do. Um, when it gets to 150 degrees, it'll most likely stay there for about a week, if not longer, and start to heat up. And so once you've noticed it gets, it gets to 150 degrees, what that typically tells you as a composter is it's probably going to get higher. So you want to monitor at 150 degrees for a few days, same with PRP, PFRP, three days is probably su sufficient. Um, and, and it'll vary on the seeds, right? But uh, three days should be sufficient, at which point you actually may want to take that pile, sort of take that pile apart, introduce water, make it a little bit smaller so that it doesn't exceed 160 degrees. But hopefully that answers your question, Andy. And if I could just add to that, I think that also depends on how big your piles are, like the pile sizes that Thomas is dealing with at Eco City Farms are pretty big, um, but uh, maybe if you're doing something smaller, your pile will not hold those temperatures quite as long. Um, the thermal mass is just less. Uh, PFRP, thank you, Melissa, is uh, the process for further redu reducing pathogens, and it's generally a best management practice for uh, allowing your compost pile to hit 
these particular temperatures for long enough to kill off any potential human pathogens. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Linda. Um, another question for Thomas, uh, which I think you mentioned, but you can you can go back and tell again about your primary sources for your food scraps. Where are they coming from? So these are Compost Crew customers, um, folks who subscribe to the food scrap collection program that Compost Crew offers. Um, so these are post-consumer food scraps. So res food scraps coming from residential houses. Great. There's a question about, um, are you aware of any potential for national requirements for commercial scale non-farm composting facilities in potable groundwater use areas to sample groundwater for oxidation reduction constituents as a byproduct of the percolated runoff? Um, well, I will say that I am not aware of <laughs> any potential for national requirements for that. Um, and I don't know, Linda, you may have something to add. Um, so I believe that this, done, this is done at the state level. And then again, at the local level, there will be rules around water quality management and what's required to manage it uh, for composting facilities. So that's something that often Department of uh, Environments will deal with. So each state is a little bit different. Um, in Maryland, I believe it's MDE that oversees that, um, but I don't know if anybody else on the in the audience knows but a lot of these, uh, the facilities that um, function under the on-farm exemption are exempt from uh, requiring or needing a full-scale compost facility uh, permit. Um, and they're generally exempt from other, uh, you know, they're sm uh, scaled small enough that they're considered to not be uh, you know, potential uh, nuisance issues that should arise. Um, but they are required, anybody that's composting in the state needs to make sure that they're not creating odors or water quality issues. So it's in a, their interest to keep tabs on how, they're, how they might be impacting the water quality in the, around them. Thanks, Linda. And I'll just add to that. I mean, I know I get a lot of questions about national requirements for composting and most, most composting requirements are at the state and local scale um, as opposed to at the national level. Um, I guess I will, I will pose a question that I had for Thomas. Um, can you talk a little bit about the job training and also, um, the, the CSA program? Yeah, sure. So, um, I guess I'll start with the, the CSA program. So the food that we grow at Eco City Farms, the primary outlet for that food is our CSA program. So for those of you who aren't familiar with the term CSA, yeah, it's community supported agriculture. And the way that it works is it's, it's basically a subscription service where folks are paying um, every month for fresh vegetables, whatever is in season. Um, the, the produce that we, uh, that we grow is put into bags and distributed to people in our area who have paid into this system. So the idea is that it's paying us basically in advance to grow and harvest and distribute the food. Um, our CSA is, is typically composed of five different um, uh, produce items. And um, we like to do um, a little a bit of mix of whatever's in season. So we do have uh, typically a couple of greens, a couple of fruity vegetables, uh, and maybe an herb or um, a garlic or an onion as well. Um, the, the job training is, is something that, you know, that's a big part of what we do at Eco City Farms. I mean, we, you know, almost every week we have a, a group that comes, whether it be a volunteer group, a school group um, that comes to, to learn about what we're doing at the farm. Uh, in addition to that, we every summer have uh, a summer youth program um, that is run by my colleague, Kayla. Um, and that program is, consists of about 20 high school students from Bladensburg. Usually they are um, enrolled at Bladensburg High School uh, and they come for a few months during the summer and they are both doing farm work, so helping us with the, the actual you know, cultivation of the soil and, and, and growing the food. And also part of their day is spent cooking 
uh, a portion of that food um, and, and learning about the, the importance of eating high nutrition foods as well. And so that's definitely something that, that we um, prioritize at Eco City Farm is sharing the knowledge um, on how to do this and the importance of eating healthy food and, and, and growing food in a way that is um, beneficial for the environment in the long term. Great. Yeah, I'm, I'm really glad that you were able to describe all that because I think it's a really important part of this, of talking about composting and, and also the connection with the community that, you know, they live around it and how do they benefit from the farm and how do they benefit and how do they engage in it and and the the local food production is really important in creating that cycle of, you know, recycling the food back into the soil and then being able to eat with it. So. Yeah, and I think one other thing I'd like to mention is the folks um, who live in the building across the street, which I highlighted in one of the images later on in the slide. Um, we also have a farm stand during the summer um, where the, any material that isn't going to our CSA customers, a sort of a secondary outlet for that is our farm stand. Um, and last year, that farm stand was very popular um, with people in the in the community, well, I shouldn't say just last year. It's been popular ever since we've done it from the early days of Eco City Farms, and so it, it is a really a way of engaging with the community. Um, and we even have folks from that building who bring bring their food scraps, uh, quite a few actually. And so it, it, you know, just kind of highlighting the the really being a part of the fabric of the community as well, which is really really important. I mean, um, with a lot of communities who, you know may not connect to it and may not know what composting is and therefore, you know, aren't used to it, bringing them on board, bringing them in and, and helping them be a part of it, I think creates that really important connection. Um, so you guys are doing a great job with that. I know we only have a few minutes left. And with that, um, I asked Linda if she would just talk for a minute or two about the, the ILSR Community Composting Training Course. I just took it um, last week for Compost Awareness Week. They had free registration for folks in the Mid-Atlantic. And I can say that it's a, it's a really fantastic training program and um, you can take it on your own time and it's virtual. So I'm gonna let her just briefly mention it. Thank you, Elena. Um, so I just added the link to the landing page for that course in the chat. But essentially, um, the course took what we were doing before the pandemic, kind of in-person training. Uh, we de developed the content with EcoCity Farms over a few years of working together. And we distilled basically whatever what we could put into this sort of video-based format um, so that people can go through this information at their own pace because everybody uh, is coming, starting at different foundation levels of their understanding about composting um and so uh we designed the course to create basically a, a common vocabulary and just create like a basic understanding of uh composting its impacts how it's done how it can be done to engage the community um and best management best practices that we've observed from the dozens of community composters that we've worked with from around the country over the years um so uh the course is Enrollment in the course is generally $100 per person. However, we never want the cost of the course to be something that prevents folks from gaining this information if, uh, or accessing this information if they want it. Um, there's opportunities for bulk discounts uh, for groups that are regist registering together. And there's also uh, always the opportunity to request an individual scholarship. So check out the um, landing page for more information, but also certainly feel free to reach out with any specific questions. Thanks, Linda. With that, we're gonna wrap up and I'm gonna turn it back over to Molly. I really wanna thank Thomas and Linda for sharing all this really wonderful information. And um, as we try to advance composting in our region, we have a lot of wonderful partners and a lot of resources to draw upon. So um, definitely connect to, to this network and I'll turn it over to Molly. Thank you, 